This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. Can you help me with another Georgia expression here? This is, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. You'll have, help me with, with fresher language than that. But I, I am making this point here for you to look at that we have not done justice to the component of the gospel of the kingdom which says that you are the kingdom. <laughs> oh, if I could just be there and hold the door for a thousand years. No. <laughs> it's not much better than going to heaven and playing a harp on a pink cloud. It could be very boring. Oh, if I'm really worthy, oh, if I could just hold... Wait a minute. Maybe God is more excited about your talent than that. Maybe. What talent have you got that God didn't give you? And somebody else mentioned earlier, you know, God is using us. He can do that. God could easily just do all this from heaven, right? But he's so fascinated by his own creation and the talents that he's given that he wants to use them. I get it. That actually makes a lot of sense. Now to my other topic then. A dimension and component of the Abrahamic kingdom gospel message to which we have not paid, I think, anything like enough attention. It's the issue of Christian hope and reward. I mentioned just a handful of texts on this large subject. In both cases, truth has been hiding sometimes behind obfuscating translation <coughs> or failure to preach. Failure to preach and teach the fullness of Scripture. Many churchgoers, I contend, are exposed to a tiny fraction of the Bible. Poll some congregations, I say this, and you'd be amazed what they haven't heard ever preached. Oh, they've got their verses mostly in Paul and John, John 3.16, they all know that. But it's a tiny fraction of Scripture sometimes. Okay, Jesus is utterly straightforward and real. I love this. He's real. He's very honest. Real in his answer to Peter about what the apostles would get out of following Jesus the Messiah. I love this. John, uh, Matthew 19, 20 said, what's in it for us, Jesus? Here we are, gave up the fishing business, lost our families maybe, and we're being hassled by the church, not the ordinary people, but this miserable establishment doesn't like us. What's in it for me? And Jesus could well have given some sort of phony answer. He didn't do that. First recall Jesus. The new, he says this. The new era is so great that the lowest member of it, the one who is least in the kingdom of God, is greater than the greatest one, John the Baptist. You ever thought of that? John the Baptist, Jesus said, was the greatest man ever. And yet the least in that future kingdom will be greater than John the Baptist. Think about that. It's not wrong to be great. You see that? Provided you are clothed with humility and childlike, then greatness is okay. Jesus is great. It says he'll be great and given the throne of David. But you also are designated to have authority and power, as you're going to see. That's Matthew 11:11. 11, 11. To be in the kingdom is to be greater than the greatest human person of this present age. David, it says, became greater and greater because God was with him. Wow! That wasn't wrong. David became greater and greater. That's amazing. Okay, I get it. Second Samuel 5. Jesus was to be great. And of his Davidic kingdom, there will be no end. Greatness is something to be desired on God's terms, of course. Jesus could have given a falsely spiritual, phony, clergy sort of answer to the apostles' question in Matthew. He could have talked about, just serve God out of love, buddy. Yeah, just do it because you love God. He didn't say that. With no expectation and leaving it at that. But he doesn't. Rather, he calls a massive theme of the whole Bible. In the New Age, Jesus said, in the New Age, I'm hoping we'll get through this, when the world is reborn, you know that's the regener regeneration of the world. The world is now very degenerate. It's going to be reborn. The palingenesia, the rebirth of the world is coming. And you ain't seen nothing yet. You who have followed me, he said, will be promoted to sit on 12 thrones to administer, rule, reign, to administer, to manage the 12 tribes of Israel. That tells you the 12 tribes will be restored and regathered. It's massive. One of the great Abrahamic truths that Israel, now blinded, is going to have a major part. And Assyria and, of course, Egypt in Isaiah 19. This is something you preach about four times every Sunday. Most people have never even heard of that. Very important. Okay, so then, this was echoed by Paul, wasn't it? Correct me if I'm wrong. With indignation that his church did not understand a very simple and basic truth. Don't you understand, you guys, he said, that the saints are going to manage the world, Moffat? Do you understand it? Or, well, that's just a nice little verse. I've, I've heard that. Meditate on that. 
And it, then he said, you know, Paul, this is me now, Paul said, if you can't settle your own little disputes in church, what in the world is this? He said, have you forgotten this ABC of theology? You're going to manage the work. Come on now. I think Joel Hemphill would say, come on now. Let's get this right. That's Dan Gill. Let's get this right. Okay. This is exactly in keeping with Revelation 1, 5 to 6. It's massive. And 2, 26, 27, that's the one I'll quote to you. Do you, want to be, do you want to be like Jesus? This is me. Do you want to be like Jesus? Yes. All right. Here's what it is. To him who overcomes, I will give him power over the nation to smash them like clay pots. Do you want to be like Jesus? Just as the Father gave me Jesus, I'm giving it to you. Are you preaching on that? We should be. These are the rewards. That's amazing stuff. Okay, so to him who overcomes, that's the one I just read there. All this is based, in the middle of this paragraph, on the massively important second psalm. Really the head and chief psalm. You know, Psalm 1 is introductory. The really chief psalm, uh, psalm, rather, I say to the students in a silly way, you know, this is to be preached every Sunday, probably twice. If they haven't got Psalm 2 memorized, they ain't going nowhere fast. It's a summary of what happens when Christ comes back. Devastatingly interesting. And in, in, in Church of England, I knew nothing about this. That's another story, but I, I won't blame the clergy, but why didn't I know this? Never heard of this before. So that's that Psalm 2 provides a brilliant scene from the future when Jesus is installed in Jerusalem and people will be strongly advised, that's putting it mildly, to submit to him and to you. Wow. There are surviving people here, few people left. Isaiah 24, 6, forged and eliminated by Ellen White. Look it up in the great controversy. When she gets to a few people are left, she goes, <coughs> dot, 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 theology. Took it out because it didn't fit her system. Her view is that Satan alone is on the earth for a thousand years. And you're all in heaven going over the books. That's forgery. Got it wrong. There will be few people left. How few is few? I have no idea. A vast deep population, but few people are left. They're left there after God has intervened. These are, there are surviving people here. Few people left still with the chance to repent and populate the new world of the kingdom as mortals. This is fundamentally basic premillennialism. There are mortals there left. How few is few? I don't know, but they're there. That's very easy, pre-mill stuff. And this then is Psalm 2.9, speaks about rulership over the nations. This is alluded to no less than three times in Revelation. Jesus, I want to tell you, loved that psalm. Do you love the text that Jesus loved? He loved that. He alludes to Psalm 2 three times in the book of Revelation, which is written by Jesus. You get all this tiring scholarship. Well, who wrote Revelation? Was it just John or that John? That doesn't matter. Don't waste your time with that. This is the lying pen of the scholar. Our job is to believe what Jesus said from God. It's terribly bad, a lot of scholarship. It never gets you to repentance and belief where I think it was meant to. Okay, so... There's that verse. It's a key verse for Jesus, and that's for us. This sounds like a typical day in the coming kingdom. What about this? But the just Lord is in the midst of Jerusalem, Zephaniah, and he will never do an unjust thing. Morning by morning, he will bring out his judgment to the light, and it's not hidden. And he knows no injustice by extortion. This sounds like a day that you're not seeing right now. I don't think justice is being enforced every morning in the current time. Now to 1 Peter 1.7. As a sample. We're getting towards the end here. And Daniel 7.27. My two key verses, those two. Which have been hiding. Where there are huge truths, they tend to hide in translation. New Living Translation. This is going to speak to all of us. Because is there any person here who's not been through severe trials in his Christian life? We all, we all know what that's about. These trials will show, Peter said, that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise. Read that carefully. Much praise and a what? Glory? Wow. And honor? Wow. On the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. Some translations try to hide all that. Oh, it's praise God, honor to God. I see that. But this particular passage is talking about praise and honor and glory. You know, where Jesus said, well done. 
I said this to somebody at Christian Workers Seminar. It was an emotional moment for her. She's suffering terribly. And I said, you know, Jesus is going to say, well done. And it, it really struck her heart. We need that encouragement. Well done, you. Yes, well done, Jesus. I see it. Well done, you. Take charge of five, ten cities. Not just be a city. Take charge of it, for goodness sake. I've heard this mis misquoted even. Why are we so shy of the structure of the theocratic kingdom? Okay, so contemporary, uh, the translator's translation, nice translation by missionary linguist says, gold perishes even though it has been through the refiner's fire. When your faith has been proved, it is of much greater value than that, for it will bring you praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Contemporary English version. This is necessary that your faith may be found genuine. Your faith is more valuable than gold, which will be destroyed, even though it is itself tested by fire. Your genuine faith will result in praise and glory and honor for you when Jesus Christ is revealed. I, I, would you admit you haven't fully read those texts? How about Romans 2.7? Those who seek for what? Glory and honor and immortality. What do they get? The life of the age to come. I must confess, I've read over those texts for years. That's amazing. A little encouragement here, right? God, you ain't seen nothing yet. God is so excited about your talent. But of course, our part is that we do have to develop those talents. But we may have been underestimating our Christian hope. Perhaps that would be right. Now, where did Peter get all this? He got it from Deuteronomy 26. And the Lord has declared to Israel, he's talking to Israel here, and, and Peter takes these Israel texts, I have to tell you, everybody knows this, every commentary does, takes those Israel texts and dumps them on you. Yes, there's a future for national Israel, I see that. But for the moment, don't underestimate your position as God's treasure. That's the point. And the Lord has declared today that you, Israel, are a people for his treasured possession, special possession, as he's promised you, that you are to keep all of his commandments, so obedience is important, that he'll set you in praise and fame and honor high above all the nations that he's made, and you'll be a people holy to the Lord your God as he's promised. Isn't that staggering stuff? It, it takes, you know, several months to meditate through this. You see it, it well, it's interesting. Let me rush to the commentary. I do, I've got lots of commentaries. And I want to check them. I want to check the translation. What is he really saying? Yes. Where did he get it from? The Israel stuff placed upon the church. That's a very high privilege, isn't it? It's a great honor to be God's people. Okay, all this is based on the supremacy of Israel, we might call it, verses, which are all over the Hebrew Bible. Notably Deuteronomy 26, Isaiah 40 to 66. Sit down one Sunday and read all of those chapters together. Especially 60:12. You like this one? The nation which will not serve you is going to perish. Wow. Sounds like there's some discipline in the kingdom, at least initially to get it started. Peter calls on these Israel texts and applies them to the church. Famous one, Joe and I talk about this often, no disagreement at all. Exodus 19.6, Israel are priests and kings, but it's the church of the priests and kings. You know these texts well. We're the priests and kings. I don't think we really think about that. All of those verses will provide you with a Bible study. I'm not going to read all those, of course. Leave them alone. They're all to the same point. So if you're talking to your friends across the coffee table, there's a Bible study. Even in the middle of that top paragraph on page 9, we're getting towards the end here. In this case, mortals who die young. Did you read that? Isaiah 65, 17, you have people dying at 100 years old. Those are mortals in the kingdom. Is it clear? Let's not argue with it. Is it clear? Please get it clear. You can die at 100 years old and be a young kid. Immortals don't die. Immortals don't bear children. I hope that's quite clear to you all. Immortals do not bear children. They're not given in marriage, and they don't marry. But here are people bearing children. That's amazing. Classical premillennialism. All this gives you, then, the energizing vision. This is not dead, boring head knowledge. This is supposed to be life-giving truth. The energizing vision of the future and the testimony of Jesus, his inspired prophetic word, is the spirit of prophecy. I like that. To take away the words of Jesus, back to Joel Hempel's point in Revelation, is to lose out on life. Don't meddle with the words of Jesus anywhere, particularly there. Luther, you know, I think Joe would probably say, Luther, bless his heart. Maybe we'd better <laughs> say that. Luther, bless his heart, wrote that the book of Revelation is not a Christian book and no one knows what it says anyway. Okay, let's call him our guru, a Lutheran church. Wait, wait a minute. He said, Jesus is not taught in the book of Revelation. Now, he modified position slightly better later. 
That's amazing. And C.S. Lewis says, tell your friends, the gospel is not in the gospels. C.S. Lewis. What? The gospel is not in the gospels. It's really in Paul. That is about as systematic a mistake as you could do. And it was Joel Hempel who quoted James Kennedy, a quote that I supplied him some time back. James Kennedy is a great guy down there, not, not living any longer. Many people think that the teaching of Jesus is important. That's not true. What really counts is that God came and died. I say that's false, false, false. You better shout it loud because evil is aggressive and intentional. Unless you come against this, you're not going to get your people to understand. The gospel is in the gospels. That was the genius, in my opinion, of the Abrahamic people in 1850. They got Acts 8, 12. When they believed Philip preaching, isn't this marvelous? I hope you've got this memorized. Acts 8, 12. When they believed Philip preaching the gospel about the kingdom first and the things concerning the name, then they were ready to be baptized and only then. That's another sermon. But I find that very compelling. And the students find that interesting when they hear about it. Okay, okay. All this gives you emerging vision of the future. There it is. First Peter 1, 7 is remarkable. And hiding in many translations. Truth often hides in translation or a corrupted manuscript. As in King James, if you're a King James only person, watch out. You've got some problems there. In the famous 1 John 5, 7, it's a forgery. But there are people with PhDs trying to say it isn't a forgery. It's just nonsense. Everybody knows that's a forgery. But they don't know that 1 Timothy 6, 3 is also a forgery. That's another story, but it's wrong. And also 1 John 5, 18 is all garbled in the, in the KJV. Okay. It is thought scandalous that the believers, the international church, could receive praise and honor and fame. But commentaries often smarter. Cambridge Bible for schools. Marvelous pieces, by the way. Cambridge Bible for school and colleges. A little book on every book of the Bible. And this fellow, whose name was Plumtree, happens to be a distant relative of mine by marriage, says the context and the parallelisms with Romans 2.7, he quotes it, to those who by perseverance, is this you know, in doing good, you're seeking for glory and honor and immortality with great humility, I'm sure. You're gaining the life of the age to come. Make it certain that the praise, this commentary says, and the glory and the honor refer to the praise and the glory which men and women will receive when sufferings rightly born have done their work. Isn't that marvelous? And there it is in 1 Corinthians 4. I couldn't believe this when he quotes these. I, you know, I've read over these things. Then each man will receive praise. His praise will come to him from God. Note that this will happen at the future apocalypsis, the second coming, revelation of Jesus. Thus, I want to say this, now going to heaven when you die, promoted tirelessly by that massive organization we call church, turns out to be false and deceiving. The false idea is based on the erroneous teaching about an immortal soul, which must live on in heaven or an eternal torturing hellfire. Those caught in these deceptions are unable to say, there's a lie in my right hand. They then defraud the one in the right with meaningless arguments. That's a good text, comfort you a little bit. Ever heard any meaningless arguments? I think we do. The glory, honor, and fame, or renown, honor, and beauty, same thing, which is the destiny of the faithful, is simply a repeat of that Deuteronomy text I just read. God will set you high above the nations, and so on. Now, finally, Daniel 7 is the indispensable starting point for defining the heart of the gospel of the kingdom. In verse 18, the saints receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. The saints get it. They get the kingdom forever. Verse 22, judgment was passed in favor of the saints, of the most holy one, and the time came, not timeless eternity. See, the devil's trick is to say, oh, it's all beyond time. King James, gross mistranslation, there'll be time no more. What? Are you looking forward to living beyond time? You know, watch has no meaning. No, of course not. There'll be no more delay. It's built into your translations, these errors. No, the time comes when the saints get the kingdom. And verse 27, note the trick here. Then the sovereignty, dominion, greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. Their kingdom, the best translations are, will be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions will serve and obey them. Interesting. Those translations there, CEB and so on, they get it right. Comparing to Matthew 5, blessed are the meek, they will possess, not inherit. Inherit isn't the best word. Inheritance suggests you somebody has to die before you get it. That's not wrong. Better, possess the earth. Quoted from Psalm 37 six times and live there forever, by the way. 
I'm sure you can take trips around the moon and all that. Don't worry about that. But your residence is first and foremost in the kingdom. You will dwell there forever. So that Matthew 5, Psalm 37, to be preached at least three times every Sunday. I have had to learn, somebody, some kind teacher told me many years ago, Anthony, you have to learn to repeat yourself. Because though you may think you understand it, you're not, it's very selfish to imagine, because you've got it there. So go on preaching this week by week by week by week about inheriting the earth. And then people will get the point and love it, probably. Okay, our hope, finally, is the vision of the future theocracy foreshadowed or actually predicted in the entire Old Testament. God appears to be so delighted with the prospect of future peace on earth when the whole world will be at peace, as Isaiah 14, 7, and they break forth into singing. Isaiah says more than any book, shout for joy and sing, because you ain't seen nothing yet. And he dedicates most of scripture, God does, to this topic. No wonder that the whole hope of messianic peace and the cessation of all war, the end to ISIS, has been so totally derailed by the grand mistake that heaven is where you go at death. So drop the word heaven. Give it up. Speak of the life of the coming age in on the earth, and then you sound like Jesus. Don't be afraid, little flock. Isn't this comforting? Don't be scared, little flock, because your father is delighted to give you the kingdom. You are the kingdom. There, is, there you notice this in Matthew 5? Theirs is the kingdom. You see, it belongs to them. Isn't that fascinating? I only saw that the other day. We read over this. Finally, final page. The scene at the beginning of the millennium, the first stage of the future kingdom, I would call that millennium, first stage of the future kingdom of God on earth is exactly described by that famous Psalm 2. Nations unwilling to submit to Jesus and the saints will be eliminated. They are strongly advised to submit to the new theocratic government. The whole Old Testament is either a shadow or type. Think of judges and kings and chronicles, right? What's this all about? Judges and kings. How to be a good judge, a good king, right? This is exactly the theocratic kingdom coming. Or if it isn't that, it's a clear prophecy and vision of the great theocracy to come. Sixteen prophets transport you into the decisive time between the great tribulation and the arrival of Jesus with his glorified immortalized saints. They having, I add, it's not a preacher of rapture, it's being caught up to meet him at his one second coming and coming down to the earth with him. Okay, so this is the true greatness promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets and saints. That's the one where he said, when you see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom and you hypocritical religious people being cast out, that's going to be a tragedy. They were horrified at that. Okay, so finally, this is the storyline, I suggest, the storyline and plot. And if your congregation hasn't got the plot, they ain't got it. They've got bits and pieces and snippets of being good chap. We call this jolly good chap theology. It's not jolly good chap theology, much more. It's messianic theocratic theology, I suggest. Okay, finally then, two brothers <coughs> who sought prime positions in the coming kingdom were not told that there is no such thing as a hierarchy. They were told that the positions could be achieved by a degree of suffering now, and that God makes the appointments. The one who does well with his or her talent is praised by Jesus. Well done, good and faithful servant. Take charge of and be in permanent, I'm translating the Greek literally, be in permanent authority over ten cities. Please note, you're not going to be in authority over other immortals. Is it clear? I hope so. This is classical premillennialism. Are you ready and prepared for this? Has the energy of this hope invaded your life? What happened to the less talented and who produced nothing is a terrible threat. I've heard this preached wrong by people. The worthless servant was hurled into what? Outer darkness? You don't do anything with your talent, you're in bad, bad trouble. You don't squeeze in, you're out. I think it's reasonable. For God, he gave you talent, you've got to do something with this talent. That seems to be it. Okay, as John said finally, we are all to strive for a full reward. How much preaching on that verse? There are degrees of reward. You want to get the full reward, right? Don't miss out. Second John 8. Watch yourselves, said John, that you do not lose what we've accomplished, that you may receive a full reward. The same trenchant warning was given to the church of Laodicea, where, as a recent speaker at Christian Workers' Seminar pointed out, Jesus did not observe the advice from Thumper, movie Bambi. If you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. <laughs> Jesus did not take that advice. 
He said nothing at all good about the leaders in church, except that he would spit them out. Wow. Tough. What sort of a Jesus is this? Okay, Philadelphia Church is the work where you need to be. It's the one to follow. I know your deeds. I know what you're doing. I'm watching you. Look, I've placed an open door before you. Is this the internet? I wonder. And whatever that is, open door for evangelism, which no one can shut. Because you have a little power, you haven't got massive power, but you've got a little power, and you have kept my word, which is not just the Bible, it's the word of the gospel of the kingdom. There's nothing more fundamental than that than you can teach and must teach. The kingdom message is the word. You've kept it. You've not denied my name. Compare Acts 8, 12, when they believe Philip preaching the kingdom name of Jesus. These are standard verses. Then I will make, listen to this, I'll make those of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, whatever they are exactly, and they are not, they're lying. I'll make them come and worship, excuse me, proskineo, fall down at your feet and admit that you were right and they weren't. I mean, this is amazing stuff, isn't it? Amazing stuff. Proskineo, worship. Notice in Isaiah 45, 14, where the true Israel is actually supplicated to. Only place in the Bible in that verse. The true people of God are prayed to, supplicated. Prosevshomet, very unusual verse. The true Israel is actually supplicated. Okay, finally, because you've kept the word of my perseverance, that's the parable of the sower, Luke 8, I will also preserve you from the hour of testing the great tribulation, which is about to come on the entire world, to test those who dwell on the earth, I'm coming quickly. Hold on to what you have. That seems to be the bug on the front of Joe Martin's car. So that no one will take away your what? Your crown. You are the royal family in training for a world that's going to work. And is there anybody here who thinks the world is working well right now? It doesn't seem to. <laughs> you are the solution. God can do it if he wants to. Anyway. Kingdom destiny of the faithful is a massive Bible theme. Begin preaching it. Take you six months at least. A year. You've got to preach through this. Bit by bit by bit. Massive theme. And you'll see the energy and life coming into your congregation. See, so many, pre so many preachers are saying, you've got to be more loving. Oh, well, you've got to be better. You know, good, good chap, jolly good chap theology. Have you ever thought of this, Colossians 1.4? How many times do you preach this one? It says that love and faith are because of hope, because you are driven by your destiny, this produces love and faith. Most congregations don't do that. You've got to be more loving. You're not loving. No faith. You need more faith. Wait a minute. Try preaching hope clearly. Don't fudge, muddle the kingdom of God and get it all mixed up. That's not going to work. Try preaching it along these lines and it may produce more energy perhaps. Okay, that's enough. Enough. Thank you. Okay.